uh, hopefully you had a good lunch and you're now super excited about becoming experimentalist. So that's my <laughs> that's my goal to convert you all from your theory path to experimental path. Um, no, that's actually not my goal. My goal is uh, just to maybe make you appreciate kind of what we can do in the experiment and to then uh, make this uh, connection between theory and experiment. If you're more on this side, it's very helpful to know what is possible, what is easy and what is hard on the right side. But of course, also if you're on the right side, okay, you want to know all the beautiful physics that you can realize in your system. So I think this dialogue between experiment and theory is always super, super important. And kind of where are we now? Um, basically, the, the way I structure these lectures, we start from nothing. Literally, we started from nothing. We kind of uh, first picked, okay, which atom should we have? And then we uh, started with big nothingness, like our vacuum chamber. We put some atoms in there. Then we discussed a little bit laser cooling. I gave you kind of this intuitive picture. Photon kind of pushes the atom, and, and uh, together with magnetic fields, we can make this uh, beautiful cold cloud of atom that looks like this. And then, basically, these are way too many atoms. These are maybe a hundred million atoms. Um, we want uh, something simpler. And then we talked about this dipole trapping or this optical trapping. Uh, and this is also part of your homework to kind of uh, convince yourself that these energies shift and that you can use that to uh, trap single atoms. And that's kind of where we arrived last time then by realizing that if you can shift the ground state of an atom by interacting with light. So, so we had just two levels, and then we were shifting this ground state. And okay, the upper state also shifted up, but if we are here, then basically the atom can lower its energy by going to the place where it sees a lot of light. And then the only trick was, okay, let's just focus light very tightly, and the atom wants to go into the middle there, and that will be our single atom trap. And then there was already the question last time, what is preventing from having multiple atoms there? And basically, yeah, I did a little bit of a hand-wavy explanation. Nothing is preventing from having multiple atoms in these optical tweezers. But once you load two atoms, they actually kind of form a molecular state. And if you excite this molecule, then both atoms gain enough energy to be kicked out. So that is both annoying and also super useful because uh, on the one hand, it's a little bit annoying. You kind of randomly have maybe zero or one atom. But on the other hand, it's amazing because you never have more than one atom. It really ensures that you just have a single atom. So this is where we left off last time. We have these light-assisted collisions. And then here, typical, typical loading efficiency um, loading efficiency into these optical tweezers. Efficient, whatever, like this, uh, is about 50%. Okay, so with 50% chance, you have a single atom or you don't. But okay, now we are getting a little bit greedy. We started with 100 million atoms. Now we just have zero or one atom. Of course, we want more. And now, how do we get more? So, so, so. Uh, we want more, <laughs> more atoms. Well, and, and uh, okay, you would also come up with this. So the way you get more is by just having arrays, arrays of optical tweezers. So we don't just send a single light beam into our lens or microscope objective, uh, but we send many light beams, and they make many tweezers. And actually, let me scroll back up to this picture. This picture is quite useful. Um, so here, we just have a single optical tweezer. And now the way you make multiple optical tweezers is by sending more light in but then at a different angle. So what would happen if I send here a laser beam now under a different angle? Let's say it comes in under an angle like this. This is also going to focus the beam. Okay, now, now it's gonna get ugly. It's gonna focus the beam. Yeah. 
Um, but it's going to focus the beam at a different position. Actually, uh, they should be in the same plane here. So they are in the same plane, but they are now uh, delta, uh, delta x away. So sending in multiple beams under different angles gives you in the focus plane multiple spots. Maybe, maybe you heard about this, or maybe you even did like an undergraduate experience, uh, experiment where basically a lens, what a lens does, takes basically a Fourier transform. So if I come in with different angles, different k vectors into the lens, then that is a Fourier transform, and then the focus plane, you have different positions. So momentum to position, basically. Um, so that's very useful. So arrays of optical tweezers basically um, send in multiple beams and uh, different angles. And what you get are multiple focus spots. So now you might think, okay, how do I get these multiple beams? Okay, one way would be to have now many lasers that come into your uh, microscope objective under different angles, but uh, th that's maybe not the best way because we want to have hundreds of atoms. You are not, or maybe some people might want to have hundreds of lasers, but uh, it's, it's way easier to maybe just uh, take a single laser and split it up. And I'm going to uh, explain one special technical device to you uh, that, that actually um, helped a lot in this field. And, and this uh, device is an acousto-optic acousto deflector. This is a really wonderful device. Um, and basically what it does is you send in, here's a laser uh, uh, input light, and here you have this device. Inside that device, maybe different color, uh, there's a crystal. And on this crystal, this, uh, uh, this is a piezoelectric a piezoelectric contact. So what you actually do to this crystal, you make it vibrate. And, and then uh, what happens in this crystal is uh, that you basically have a density wave in here. So you get a nice uh, acoustic density wave in here. So you send in radio frequency. So you send in maybe, let's say, 100 megahertz. And now you have this standing wave of 100 megahertz in this crystal. Of course, you see here directly uh, this, this uh, periodic modulation of the crystal is like a grating. So what happens now is um, that this laser beam is going to be deflected out of this. So, so that, that's the deflection part. So you send in a radio frequency, just a frequency, makes this standing wave, it's like a grating, and that deflects the beam. And now you could have a lens here, and have a lens here. OK, these are lenses. Uh, and over, over here, you have your vacuum chamber. This is the one we built last time. This is your vacuum chamber. So what happens, this laser beam goes down here, and now it's going to be focused here into a spot. And OK, th this works nicely for a single beam, but actually what you can do, you can send in radio frequency to, uh, tones, you can actually send in multiple. So, so you send in multiple frequency frequencies. If you send in a different frequency, then this angle will change. Could be now this angle. This angle goes down, and this one now will be focused at a different spot. And like that, you can basically fill the whole thing. You can send in many, many uh, laser beams. 
And the nice thing is this position, now each of these beams has some position xi. You can change that position by changing the frequency on the crystal. And this, is, uh, this was kind of a cool realization uh, to do that because actually you can do this in real time. That now means you can actually move atoms around. Kind of, you have the atoms in the tweezer and then you can uh, move them around. Or you can just uh, keep these uh, many frequencies on this device and then you just have an array of optical tweezers to trap an array of atoms. Uh, so this is just one option to make these tweezer arrays. Um, there are many, many alternative options. And to make, let's say, make many tweezers. Actually, you can use devices that are very similar to, I guess, that uh, projector up there. In that projector, you also don't have many light sources. You just have a single light so source. You have some kind of pixel array that then guides the light into the different positions on the screen. So that is called, for instance, a digital mirror device, DMD. Or sometimes it's called a spatial light modulator. SLM, and all of these kind of devices are used uh, in, in these experiments. Okay, since we talk about experiments, I can show you any, any questions uh, on this acousto-optic deflector. This, this will be a special tool that we will use. Um, okay, so let me show you some pictures of atoms. That's always the nice thing. I uh, have these nice pictures. Um, so here I just took these pictures because uh, these are three different ways of making tweezer arrays. Let me zoom in here a little bit. So this is an example. This is an example from, from a group in Germany, the Birke group. Uh, what they do is actually they use a micro lens array. They send a single laser beam onto this array of many uh, small lenses. Then here in this plane you have many focus spots, but that's not in the, in the vacuum chamber yet. So you have like a combination of these lenses to then bring these spots here into the vacuum chamber. And that's how you can now make tweezer arrays and trap single atoms. Here's a second example. A group in, I guess this is also Germany. Another a group in Germany. They use this device, this digital mirror device. So basically it's a pixel array that has small mirrors on it and you can switch them. And with that you can also basically uh, uh, guide the light and then make these tweezer spots in here. So, so they make pretty pictures. And all of these devices, what's special about them is basically that you can choose what geometry you do. I mean here in this micro lens array you have one fixed array so you can't really change the geometry. Here with the DMD you can change the geometry. And then the last quite beautiful example is um, from Brouvet's group, and that's in Paris. Uh, they are quite pioneers in that. And what they used was a spatial light modulator. And what actually what a spatial light modulator does is basically it makes a hologram. And when you image this hologram into your vacuum chamber, you have um, basically a hologram is kind of a phase pattern. And out of this phase pattern, you make an intensity pattern. And what's pretty cool is you can even make this in three dimensions. So, so they make this intensity pattern in three dimensions and uh, assemble basically the Eiffel Tower out of single atoms. Oh, that's quite nice. Um, all of, uh, these pictures here, this Eiffel Tower, this is really just having a tweezer array sitting there and now atoms randomly load into the tweezers. Only 50% loading chance, so what they did to make this Eiffel Tower is actually they added multiple pictures together and it looks nice. You kind of take the average uh, signal and then you don't care that it's only 50%, so you take maybe 10 pictures and then it looks nicely like an Eiffel Tower. Uh, but that's not how you want to do experiments and also I think uh, by now they could uh, also do it better. Uh, what you would like to do is actually that in each shot you get an array of atoms uh, that doesn't have any probabilistic component to it. 
So the problem is still that we have these light-assisted collisions. Um, and now this is a kind of a special thing. Um, so the problem is loading is loading is probabilistic. Um, but you can overcome this by basically moving atoms around. So you need rearrangement. Oh. And okay, the typical sequence to do that, I want you to think a bit like an experimentalist, and often as an experimentalist, we think about okay, what is the sequence of steps? Steps number one. Well, step number one is. Uh, make a cold cloud of atoms. You know how that is done. Make a cold cloud. So this is this uh, magneto-optical trap. Uh, step two is um, shine in in tweezer array. So pick your favorite method of making just an array of tweezer tweezers. And now, okay, we have the probabilistic loading, so that's bad. But the cool thing, yes. Uh, maybe that's by like. Okay, let's mute this person. Okay. All right. Okay, good. Um, okay, cold cloud of atoms. Tweezer array, tweezer array probabilistically loaded. And now, okay, we, we, I mean, every shot is different. Like you have some random configuration, but the amazing thing is uh, we just take an image and take a, take a photo. So we take a photo and on this photo, we see bright spots and dark spots. And the bright spots, they will be single atoms because we know we have these light assisted collisions. So it can at most be a single atom. Uh, and we see dark spots. Okay, there's uh, the tweezer just didn't load. And now we use number four. Typically, uh, we use this, this device, this acousto optic deflector, to move these randomly loaded atoms. Uh, into now defect free arrays. So that's um, so your initial tweezer array is always a little bit larger than what you actually need because you have 50% loading chance. So you, maybe you want twice as many tweezers as maybe your experiment or uh, your, your spin model you want to study. You load then maybe a hundred twe uh, tweezers, maybe out of two hundred tweezers, and then you take those one hundred atoms and put them where you want them. Uh, of course, there's all th these are experiments. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you lose an atom on the way. But the cool thing about these experiments is that number five, uh, you can uh, take another photo. Uh, or to uh, to verify that uh, that the rearrangement worked. I should also say nothing quantum is happening here. We are just taking beautiful pictures and and moving atoms. Yes. Ah, okay, that's that's a great question. I should have uh, said that. So when you take an image, when you take a photo, uh, you, you are sending some light that is pretty close to resonance to scatter some photons. So uh, and uh, so so you excite the atoms a few times, and uh, you have to do that maybe a thousand times because you don't collect all the photons. You meet, need maybe on the order of fifty photons or so to be convinced that there is an atom to see an appreciable signal. But actually, this kind of exciting and de-exciting doesn't heat up the atom that it would leave the tweezer. So, so you can always uh, take these images. 
yeah, so, so that's so not, uh, not just a photo, but actually you have to excite the atom to make it fluoresce. Other questions? Uh, uh, okay, this bit, uh, well, it's not that abstract, but uh, l let's look at beautiful pictures. That's what I like most. <laughs> so here is a nice, nice example. Oh, not this one. Let me take this one. So I should say also this whole kind of recipe here, this whole recipe is actually pretty, okay, I don't know, still pretty recent. So, so, so this is uh, what groups realized in 2016, multiple groups, this uh, group in France, uh, France, um, Antoine Brevet, then uh, Michel Lukin, where I was doing my postdoc at that time at Harvard, and also a group in Korea, Jay Wook An, in 2016. And over time, people have gotten quite a bit better uh, at this, actually. In the, in the beginning, it was maybe just like tens of atoms. Now here you actually see a um, rearrangement of maybe 250 atoms here, oh, something on that order. And it's exactly that sequence. Uh, so, so you first take an image, and you have to excite the atoms to take this image. You see these random bright spots. Because of the light-assisted collisions, you can be sure each of these bright spots is a single atom. Also, if you would kind of analyze this, maybe make a histogram how many photons you see, you see that they are all kind of similarly bright. It's not like one is twice as bright, which would maybe mean that it had two atoms, but they are all kind of either bright or dark. It's actually very nice in the experiments, you can just turn this into digital information. So you just take an image and then you just make an uh, array of zeros and ones. And then this array of zero and ones, uh, I mean, I don't want to make it sound too easy. Actually, the beautiful or um, kind of the, the breakthrough is really in this acoustic optic deflector. Now that in real time, you turn this zero and ones into kind of a description of, okay, take this atom from there and move it there. So in real time, you have to analyze these images. In real time, you have to calculate the trajectories where to move the atoms. And then you do that, and you take another image to verify that you have a defect-free array. Yes? Mm. That, excellent question. Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and I think maybe we will kind of come back to that question at multiple stages, but let me just answer it here quickly. So, so this whole sequence step uh, takes on the order of maybe a couple hundred milliseconds. So, so you can, let's say, 100 milliseconds. So, so per second, you can do this kind of thing 10 times. And actually, the way we do the experiments at the end, we're actually getting rid of all the atoms normally. Uh, and, and we start again from making a cold cloud of atoms, loading the tweezers, uh, rearranging them, and, th and then everything starts new. So, so, but it's actually, that's very, very quick. If you compare it to typical optical lattice, Bose-Einstein condensate experiments, they can take on the order of almost like half a minute to just do a single shot. That, that is uh, largely due uh, because kind of cooling to really build Bose-Einstein uh, condensate temperatures takes very, very long. Here, this is much more forgiving and you can do actually uh, really fast experiments. A really fast experiment means a lot of statistics, a lot of things that you can optimize, and, and that's quite an advantage. Yeah. The ah, the size, the size. Okay, yeah, yeah, great question. So here, now we said this takes about 100 milliseconds. That, that's really taking everything. I think it's a bit more important what, what is the time that it takes to go from step one to step two. This, so this is after having the cold cloud of atom loading into it, maybe between this and this, takes about, let's say, 50 milliseconds, or let, let's say, yeah, uh, okay, so step one to step two takes, okay, let's just say, takes 50 milliseconds. Uh, so then the question is, what is the chance that kind of on these orders of time scales you lose an atom? Or actually, because you take an image to verify, okay, let's say, it, to really do the experiment takes on the order of tens of milliseconds later. Okay, we will get into that. Uh, 
the way what can kind of mess this up is actually that because you don't have perfect vacuum, there's still some background atoms. These background atoms still travel at 300 meters per second. When they crash into an atom here in the optical tweezers, they will actually kick it out. So the question is, okay, how often does an atom kind of crash? And the typical lifetime of an atom in a tweezer is on the order maybe of 10 seconds. And the better you make the vacuum, you could maybe even get this to maybe a minute or longer. So that's kind of the time scale until you lose a single atom out of a tweezer. But now, okay, if you have maybe a thousand tweezers, then okay, you have to <laughs> divide this uh, by a thousand, and suddenly you kind of reach these uh, time scales. That's why people are interested in, okay, how can I make better and better vacuum that this time actually goes up and, uh, and up and now some groups are even kind of putting these things into cryostats, so cryogenically cooling can make a really good vacuum. And then I think the record is now getting this to half an hour. So when this is half an hour and you care about 10 milliseconds, okay, then you can actually go to many thousands or several thousands of atoms. It's not the optics is the problem. Okay, that will actually feed into maybe also the homework problem that you are doing. Uh, like, but uh, let's say on the order one milliwatt is enough to trap an atom. And, and if I buy a laser, I can buy maybe a 10 watt laser. So if I just like very naively look at these powers, I can pretty easily trap maybe 10,000 atoms, but you can also get more powerful lasers. So, so we are not at the limits yet of what can be done. People are now maybe trapping up to a thousand atoms, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure people will trap uh, several thousands and ten thousand atoms soon. So. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yeah, there. Yes, so, so everything we are just doing here, I could have explained by just taking colorful balls. N nothing, and, and sometimes we lose the balls out of, out of the trap. So nothing coherent uh, happened yet. That's where we will go now. Uh, so, so. But before we go there, there there's like, or oh, any other question? Just like, also atoms are really good to have fun. So I wanted to show this. Uh, oh, ah, see? <laughs> So this is also kind of uh, what you can do with atoms. You can take small movies. <laughs> and yeah, so, so these are all single shot images, uh, basically making a movie out of single atoms. Yeah, this is fun. But OK, still very classical, but fun. Um, all right. OK, so, so now, now let, let's make it interesting in the sense we don't want to just think about uh, colorful balls, but we want to think about basically the following. We want to have one atom, uh, and we want to think of it as one qubit. Or if you are, uh, or you could also think of it as one spin. If you want to do some many body physics, uh, maybe each atom could encode one spin degree of freedom, and then we. Um, and we want to use it as a simulator. So how do we get there? Oh, here's me trying to solve the homework problem. <laughs> I didn't succeed yet. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so uh, one atom, one spin, one qubit. Somehow uh, we have to have these internal states, and we have to start by initializing Uh, our qubit or our spin. And okay, often I, I draw two levels. Last time I have already shown you that's not completely true. There are many more levels. So, so let me just draw these again. So rubidium has a, a ground state manifold. And okay, has many excited states, but let's first look uh, at a particular excited state manifold. So the ground state we said is the 5s one half state. And in the 5s one half state, we had f equals 2. This is basically the total angular momentum of nuclear spin and electron spin 
and we have f equals 1. This is a total angular momentum, so we have sub-levels, basically the projections on the z-axis. Here, these are our mf sub-levels. mf, and the, those go from 2 to minus 2, and then in the 1 state we have uh, 3 of them. This sub-level 0 is quite nice because it's actually insensitive to magnetic fields. So if you wanted to encode a really long-lived qubit, often people like to use these two states. But, but okay, first we have to see how do we get to those two states. Okay, and then in the excited state, this is uh, the state, for example, that I would use for fluorescence or also for trapping. Uh, here I'm drawing the 5p 3 half stain. So now I also have the orbital angular momentum. What that basically comes down to is that I have even more of these f states. I have f equals 3, 2, 1, 0, actually. Um, okay, let me try to arrange this. And then for 3, I have the mf states 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 goes all the way from 3 to minus 3. Then I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 1. So this is actually what it looks like. And of course, there are many more uh, states. But OK, th this is enough for now. And just to give you kind of a sense of energy scales, this energy scale is our optical transition. So this is, for instance, 780 nanometer. Or if you like to think in frequency, this is uh, 380 terahertz. So this is a, a large separation. This is where our laser comes in. Uh, up here, these transitions, they are typically uh, maybe separated by 100 megahertz. Uh, and down here, this transition is 6.8 gigahertz. So this is not optical, this would be microwave. So actually, by shining in microwave, I can actually uh, manipulate those transitions down there. But okay, now when, when I take an image like here in the rearrangement or so, I see these fuzzy balls. I actually have no idea where, where the atom is in the all, all, all of these uh, kind of hyperfine states. Could be anywhere, and probably it is anywhere. You're just in some uh, big mixed state of all, of all these possibilities. So you need a way to initialize it. And the tool, basically for most of the things now, the tool to the tool is called uh, optical selection rules. And and the idea here is basically uh, when light interacts. Uh, light interacts with atom. Uh, it changes angular momentum. So the light itself, actually, a single photon also has angular momentum. And okay, as we absorb this photon, okay, angular momentum has to stay conserved. So somehow, okay, the photon is gone, but the angular momentum is still conserved. So the atom has to change its angular momentum. What this means is, okay, as we interact with the photon, we have to change our orbital. So this is this s and this p. Uh, yeah, this is just convention. Uh, uh, sp has to change by plus or minus one. That's why this first excited state I'm drawing here, I didn't draw you like a 6s state. Actually, you can't go from 5s to 6s. You have to change this orbital angular momentum, and that's why you go from s to p. So that has to change because of the uh, momentum of the photon, and also the projection of this orbital angular momentum on the z-axis, that has to change and it changes by the polarization of the photon. 
So when you shine in linear polarization, it doesn't change. It actually stays zero. And if it's circularly polarized, it changes by plus or minus one. Um, OK, I didn't derive all these atomic levels. So here I'm somehow using L and LZ. That's the kind of the orbital. Uh, but actually, w once we have electron spins and nuclear spins, the correct basis to describe everything is this total angular momentum F and MF. And these uh, rules here, this delta L plus minus 1 and delta LZ equals polarization translates and translates in our hyperfine basis into the following. Um, OK, the total angular momentum, this SP, uh, still has, or the orbital has to change by 1. And then this delta F can stay the same or changes by plus minus 1. And now this delta MF equals the polarization of the photon. OK, all right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's possible to do this kind of approach for more than one isotope from rubidium. Because in the case of rubidium, normally we have uh, samples that they have rubidium 85 and 87. Mm -hmm. I think this, your example is for 87, right? Exactly. That, that OK. Right. But for the 85 rubidium, mm -hmm. we have another frequencies in uh, between the, the F equal 2 and F equal 3 in, the, in 5S1, 1.5. Um, I mean, the optical selection rules, they stay the same. They, they, they don't change. But rubidium-85, and maybe here you have to help me. Um, I think it doesn't have the same uh, uh, nuclear spin or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the difference is in the, the ground state, five, five as one, one over two, we don't have F equal one. We have F equal two and F equal three. Ah, okay. So, so, uh, so the nuclear spin is is, is uh, one higher. Uh, yeah. So, so the, these levels change. Like you have uh, maybe just the uh, two and the three level there, but the selection rules they don't change. So, so I'm. Uh, this is a really good point. I'm I'm describing rubidium eighty seven here. So. Um, 87, but there's also rubidium 85, uh, slightly different transition, slightly different level structure, but the selection rules stay the same. My question is because uh, normally the sample has two two isotopes. It has both, yes. Yeah, so, so these atomic sources, like I said in the beginning, oh, let's just put a little piece of rubidium in there. If we do that, probably we have both isotopes, rubidium 85 and rubidium 87. But because uh, the transitions are slightly different, I can actually, by changing the frequency of my laser, I can decide, do I make a cold cloud of 85 or do I make a cold cloud of 87? So by basically frequency selectivity, I can choose which isotope I work with. OK, OK, thanks. Yeah, yeah no, it's a great question. Or I could even work with both, which, which is also interesting. OK, so. I'm dumping a lot of kind of rules on you, but okay, they just come from photons have angular, uh, have, uh, angular momentum, atom has angular momentum, angular momentum has to stay conserved, and this gives us these rules. Um, there's, there's one special rule, there's one special exception. Uh, you cannot have a transition uh, delta F equals zero from MF equals zero to an excited MF equals zero. This just comes out of this translation. It's a small detail, but actually an important detail. Um, so these are my rules. And now, actually, I could make a quiz. Yeah, let's do a quiz. Now let's do a quiz. I'm going to draw these states again. OK. I so this is the excited state. We have uh, seven levels, then we have five levels. It's basically, it's too much. But uh, these selection rules help us to 
get rid of all these many levels. And then down here for rubidium 87, very correctly said, I have these um, eight levels. So now, and let me give you the quantum numbers. So this was F equals three, two, one, zero. And this is two, one. And here you see the rules. These are the rules. So now I could draw a light field, for example, that goes from here, starts here, and goes up to here. So this is MF, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, so this goes from MF minus one here to MF minus two here. And it starts from a f equals two state and goes to a three state. <laughs> Lot, lots of numbers, but the question is, is this allowed or is this forbidden? Basically, you have the rules. Uh, and the question is, is it allowed or forbidden? So who thinks it's allowed? You have to raise your hand. Who thinks it's forbidden? You have to raise your hand. <laughs> Only Ricardo wants to play the game. Or, or who's undecided is also fine. Huh? Uh, yes, so if you now go circularly polarized, you can change MF by 1. So certainly you can go from MF minus 1 down here. Uh, this is minus 1 to MF equals minus 2. So basically this rule here is a check that's allowed. And then, okay, we changed F from 2 to 3. But okay, that's also allowed. So, so, so this is a transition that indeed is allowed. Okay. So now completely random, I'm going to pick a transition that's not allowed. And, and then we do the same quiz. <laughs> so, so let's go here. Like if we were to start down here, F equals 1, MF equals 1. And we were, for example, trying to go to the same MF equals 1 state, but in the F equals 3 state. Okay, now, if you is this transition allowed? Nobody raises their hand. Is it not allowed? Yeah, everybody raises their hand. Very good. Uh, why is it not allowed? In principle, okay, this, this rule is fulfilled. You can not change the MF state by shining in linearly polarized line, but, okay, because we changed F from one to three, we basically skip one, and, and we are not uh, we are not good and on this rule. So this is how you can basically go through all these levels and and uh, decide which transitions are allowed and which ones are forbidden. But okay, the goal here is to uh, use these rules now to initialize our system. We said okay, we don't know where in the ground state the atom is. So now one way to initialize. And we wanted to initialize. And I'm just uh, going to throw something out there. Uh, we shine in use circularly polarized line. So we always have these degrees of freedom. We have the polarization, and then we also have uh, the, the color or the frequency of the light. And we're going from F equals 2. 2F, and sometimes in the excited state, just people like to put a prime there. So just to make it very obvious, this is now in the excited state. 2F prime equals, yeah, let's say F prime equals 3. Yeah, let's do F prime equals 3. Or let's actually do F prime equals 2. Um, and circularly polarized light, okay, and, and this is it. Uh, so, so what happens, and let's say we have plus circularly polarized light. So we're shining in light here from 2 to 2 up there, and it's positively polarized. So, so, so we could, for example, do this one is allowed. This one also works. This one works. This one works. And then funnily, this guy doesn't have an excited state anymore. So, so, this, uh, so this state is somehow special. 
because this state doesn't get excited. This is what uh, people call a dark state. So we shine in the laser light, and all of the states want to be excited except one special state. So what that actually means is, if we start anywhere, anywhere in this F equals 2 manifold, anywhere that is not MF equals 2, we can go to the excited state. And when we are in the excited state, actually the same selection rules, they also apply to the emission. Like we can't break these selection rules in kind of the reverse process. So once we're up here, we could be going back down. We could also be going back down here by emitting a linearly polarized uh, photon, or we go here. But you see, okay, let, let's say the chance was one third uh, each kind of. Uh, we go here, we go here, we go here. If we go here, then okay, next time we could also come back here, or we go here, or we go there. And you see, bit by bit, if you do this uh, more and more times, you are going to end up over here. So eventually you're going to end up over here because once you're in this state, you are not going to interact with the light anymore. So this is now an awesome way because it allows you to initialize into a state F equals 2, MF equals 2. Simply by shining in light at the right frequency with the right polarization. So this is our way to initialize. And there, there are different ways of doing that. You can actually also make this MF equals zero state, a dark state with different polarization. Um, and, and this is how you initialize the system. So out of the many ground states, we have now made one special. And once we know where we are, we can actually also then apply microwave transitions to take it anywhere else. So we just have to have one defined starting state that we know, and then we can uh, initialize it in any state that we wish. So this is the first thing you need when you, when you uh, set up now your experiment. And the second thing, or another thing we would like, um, so we can initialize, we want to be able to measure. Um, and for, for measuring, we could... Uh, we could, for instance, uh, scatter many photons. So scattering photons just means exciting and re-exciting. Scatter many photons uh, on, yeah, on uh, ideally what people call this a cycling transition. So transition that you can just keep on scattering photons from without changing the state on cycling transition. So where is such a cycling transition? Okay, I'm gonna, can also, I'm going to draw this again, sorry. One, two, three, one. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. So there's one special transition. So this is F equals two, and here's F prime equals three. So there's this transition from MF equals 2 to MF equals 3. And this transition is uh, somewhat special because if we scatter, if we excite on this transition, we basically have nowhere else to go but back there. So this is a nice transition because we can only change MF by 1, and we can only change F by 1. And it's already 3, it's kind of maximized. The only ground state I can go to is F equals 2. And MF is 3, so the only ground state I can go to is MF equals 2. So this is a great transition because it basically means you can, without changing the spin state, cycle many times here and get many photons back. So this is one way of determining what the uh, state of the atom is. Um, another way, so this is scatter many photons on a cycling transition. This is maybe one way to measure. Actually, what, what does happen, there's still a problem, because as you scatter many photons, you always heat up the atom a little bit. You're going to kind of uh, continuously kick it, so you might lose the atom. Or sometimes maybe this perfectly cycling transition is actually not 100% perfect. Maybe the spin flips. So instead, 
what you often do is actually a second way, and that is state dependent. State dependent. State dependent loss plus fluorescence. So we are really good at taking images of the atom. But when we take these images that are so nice for the rearrangement, actually we are going to move through all kinds of states. We are going to completely scramble the ground state. Uh, so what you do typically in the experiment is first, you basically kick out all the atoms that are, for example, in the F equals 2 state. You just eject them basically by on purpose heating them out by kicking them really hard with a laser. And then you take these fluorescence images and determine uh, which atoms are still left. So that's uh, kind of, uh, I mean, I could go into more details, but this is the most standard way how to uh, detect what the state of the atom is. It's state selective expelling of the atoms out of the tweezer and then taking an image of which atom is left. Th this is what we like to do. Okay, so, so we can initialize, we can measure our atom or our qubit or our spin. The last thing that we need is uh, the manipulation. of qubit states or spin states. And okay, here I think I already said so so we are in the ground state, for instance, here in the ground state manifold. Now I'm not going to draw the excited state anymore. The excited state is just for us to scatter photons or to initialize. So I'm just gonna summarize it here. There's one state. And we know how to initialize, so what we can do is actually we can maybe isolate two states here. And as I said, actually these mf equals zero states, they are nice because they are very coherent, uh, because they are insensitive to magnetic field. And then the way I manipulate these states, say for example I can initialize here, all I need to do is basically send in now microwaves. Ooh. So I do microwaves, microwaves at exactly this hyperfine splitting, which is 6.8 gigahertz. So I can have my qubit states. I could have my one uh, just being f equals two, mf equals zero, and my zero could be f equals 1, mf equals 0. And these states are magnetically insensitive. Insensitive, and that means they have long coherence time. And what means long? I don't know, take a guess. Uh, or let's do it differently. Wh what is a typical coherence time for superconducting qubits? And I'll randomly pick people. Or just take a guess, doesn't matter. Yeah, that's pretty good. In the order of microseconds, maybe really good superconducting qubits, tens of microseconds. Uh, that's pretty good. Um, what is it here for these atoms? Okay, I'm picking you again, I'm sorry. Hundreds of microseconds? Yeah, actually hundreds of microseconds is uh, not bad. I can definitely, without doing anything special, even get hundreds of microseconds kind of between states that are magnetically sensitive. If I work a bit harder and work with these MF equals zero states and I actually make sure that I don't have any stupid technical kind of complications, and I can actually quite easily get this up to 10 seconds. So, so, so uh, now, now we have 10 seconds coherence times of these qubit states. So if I had a quantum startup and I want to pitch to the VC, I would say, oh, this is like so many orders of magnitude better than uh, superconducting qubits. Of course it is, which it is. <laughs> but uh, actually, you always have to kind of compare this to what is your typical operation time. 
So how long does it actually take to manipulate these, uh, these qubits? Maybe here you can reach um, operation speeds. Uh, speeds that are maybe on the order of one microsecond. And that's actually pretty nice. So, so, so now your, your operation is kind of on the order of a microsecond. Your coherence time is 10 seconds. If you work a bit hard, if you don't work hard, it's maybe one second or so. So you can do basically millions of operations before something goes wrong, if your operations are good. And then we will uh, see uh, how good they actually are. So, so, so you're actually in a really nice regime. You have these uh, extremely coherent states. Your operation times are very uh, short. So you can do lots of interesting things. Um, let me, because it was asked kind of um, what the repetition time is or what typical time scales are. So you're an experimentalist now. So you think about experimental sequences. So typical. Typical experimental sequence. Uh, so, so here I'm drawing just an arrow of time. Uh, and the typical experimental sequence, okay, step number one, cold cloud of atoms. We make a magneto-optical trap. You can do this maybe in something like Okay, let's say 25 milliseconds. In 25 milliseconds, you can trap millions of atoms in this cold ball. Okay, step number two, load. Oh, let's gain a bit space. Step number two, load tweezer. So the tweezer array, we, we are going to randomly load it. That actually only takes like on the order of a millisecond few milliseconds, doesn't, doesn't take a long time. Now, okay, now we do first image, first image. To collect enough photons, like we want about 50 photons or so, um, we need maybe on the order of 10 milliseconds. Then the next step is we move our tweezers around. So we do a rearrangement. Rearrange. That maybe also takes on the order of, let's say, 10 milliseconds. Of course, the larger you now go, if you go for the 10,000 atoms like uh, you want to go, then it takes longer. Uh, but uh, typical, maybe 100, uh, 10 milliseconds, maybe up to 100 milliseconds, depending on how large uh, it is. Then, okay, next one is second image. We want to verify that the atoms are exactly where we want them. So here we uh, put another 10 milliseconds. Okay, I'm running out of space. Um, okay, let's do it like this. You can't do that, or some can. But okay, I will post also these lecture notes. Also the last ones I think are already uploaded. Okay, now, okay, we have the colorful balls where we want them. Now we initialize, we prepare our spin or our qubit state. That is actually super fast. That only takes microseconds. Now we do our, okay, this is all just preparation. Like all, all of these steps we just did to get atoms to where they should be, to put the internal states to our starting state. And actually the interesting things only happen here. This is my calculation. Maybe my simulation. So this is kind of the exciting stuff. Um, and and, 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 and uh, next we will talk about the exciting stuff that goes in there. But since these operations we said is kind of on the order of microseconds, depending on how many operations you do, actually this block is also only on the order of like maybe tens of microseconds, or let, let's give it may maybe even a hundred uh, microseconds. So here, uh, here this block is actually quite short. Uh, and then the last, the final thing is, the final thing is always uh, take an image. And that's our measurement to know what is the outcome of this, uh, um, uh, of this calculation or simulation. 
So you see here we have about, yeah, let's say this is total on the order of 100 milliseconds. Depends on what you do exactly. So this is actually pretty fast. So, so every 10 times per second you're doing a new experiment. and You do that with hundreds of atoms. So, so, so this is uh, actually very fast. Uh, and it's good to realize that everything, everything up to here, basically, everything up to here is completely, I would say, classical. So, so there are no qubits, no spins yet. And then only here it gets really, in, I mean, really interesting. And suddenly you care about maybe coherence time on the order of 100 microseconds. And depending on which states you work with, if you work with these magnetically insensitive states, that's actually super easy. So, so, so that's what makes this uh, system so interesting. It's you have a lot of atoms, potentially a lot of qubits, a lot of spins, and they are very coherent. And you can get a lot out of that here in this block. And okay, then you have really good measurements. And um, yeah, any questions on on, on this? This step here, yes. So in, in some way you would have to have uh, like feed it into like a computer what your state is and then exactly. based on that. Okay. Exactly. So, so sometimes I get asked, okay, why are these tweezer arrays such a hot topic uh, now and, and why wasn't, weren't they developed earlier? And okay, there, there was, I would say there was not a single breakthrough that enabled this. So, so there was not like some big insight or so. It was just like uh, the, I mean, okay, there were a couple of uh, insights. And there was also kind of just that a lot of good classical technology comes together. Because here you actually have to be really fast. You have to take these uh, high quality, uh, high signal to noise images, analyze them in real time, and then in real time collect, uh, um, calculate these trajectories. And people maybe early 2000s didn't realize yet that the acousto-optic deflector is so powerful that you can actually now with this tool move atoms that quickly around uh, and I think that enabled that. But it's really like because maybe let's say you have a hundred tweezers now okay what are the possible classical configuration okay 50 percent loading possibilities so, so you have two to the power 50 possible classical configurations so it's something that you cannot really, I mean, maybe that example you can still, but you cannot really calculate for all trajectories what is the best move beforehand, but actually you have to take an image, see what it is, and then you have to have an algorithm that maybe uh, does the best, and you should probably not try to do the best because that's actually a computationally hard problem. You should just do a sufficiently well-behaved uh, uh, sorting algorithm that you end up in the configuration you want to. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really classical uh, computation power and kind of these classical technologies that came together to make this possible. Great question, thanks. Okay. Right, right, right. So, so, so now the whole rest will all just be about this step here. So all, all, all before was just to, sometimes I think of it like get your canvas ready. So you want your spins in the place. You kind of line them nicely up. You are interested in some, let's say, fr frustrated magnet uh, magnetism on a Kagome lattice. So you program in your tweezers in a Kagome uh, geometry. You now have the rearrangement to put the atoms in the Kagome geometry. But okay, now you want to make these spins actually interact with each other to, to, to uh, study what happens. So, so this is all about this step. And I've shown you how to manipulate qubits or spins, but all that we have done up here, like we shine in microwaves, okay, these are just single qubit operations. So, so now you have uh, maybe a hundred atoms there, but all you can do is just rotate single qubits. Still pretty boring. So, so, so what uh, now all is about is uh, making this interesting, and what makes it interesting is to have interactions between the atoms. And interactions is, is the thing that would give you maybe two qubit gates if you think quantum computing, so you can make entanglement, or it's the thing that makes now your many body physics uh, interesting. So this is now the big second chapter of these lectures. Um, 
and this will be Rydberg interactions. So let's think just briefly where we are. We have atoms sitting in whatever geometry you want. So just these balls, they sit in their tweezers. But the typical distance here, the typical distance, uh, just because uh, this is optics and this is how much we can maybe have optical resolution, the typical distance here is micrometers. This is very different. Maybe some of you have thought about optical lattices and then optical lattices. It's, it's very different. You have this periodic potential and atoms can move or tunnel around. That can give you interactions, uh, but, but uh, actually very slow interactions. Here, it's actually even worse. The atoms are even further away from an optical lattice, and there's no tunneling in between them at all. Uh, they're completely independent. Actually, over micrometer, you, you can think about what are the interactions. So, so let's say over this distance, I mean, the first thing that would come to my mind, how can I make these atoms interact? Okay, they have some electron spin. So I would ask the question, what are spin-spin interactions? Actually, spin-spin interactions over these distances, uh, the strength is on the order of hertz. So that, that, That's pretty, pretty bad. So even though we have maybe second coherence time, maybe now, and okay, I, I don't think anybody has observed this, but now even if you put them really close together, you could maybe see one interaction cycle, uh, not, nothing really uh, interesting happening yet. So spin-spin interactions are way too weak. So basically, spin-spin interactions are magnetical dipole interactions. Now the trick is, I'm, I'm building up to why we need these Rydberg interactions, the trick is to consider consider a dipole, uh, like electrical dipole-dipole interactions. Ah, yes. No. That's, that's a great question. Temperature is around microkelvin. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So these atoms, you're asking exactly great questions. These atoms, they sit in this harmonic potential. Uh, and trap frequencies, so you can think of this harmonic potential as uh, having uh, mul multiple, uh, I mean, yeah, just in harmonic oscillators. Typical trap frequencies are on the order of 10 or maybe 100 kilohertz. So, the, so, so they're actually not so, um, they're not so large. Yesterday, somebody was talking about uh, trapped ions. There, the trap frequencies are much larger. And now you can, the atom is actually on the order of maybe 10 microkelvin uh, cold. And then what that means is actually that the atom populates a few of these uh, uh, states. And classically, what that means, okay, the atom is kind of jiggling a bit around here. And then this... Uh, this maybe delta, delta x is on the order of maybe 100 nanometer or so. Uh, th th that number will kind of become important uh, in a little bit, but it's actually, okay, the atoms are sitting there. You can still think of them almost like classical balls in these uh, optical tweezers. I mean, people have become really good at cooling, and there are ways to put it really in the ground state here, but if you don't do anything special, Maybe your position spread is on the order of 100 nanometers. Exactly, exactly. Great question. So, so for, for trapped ions, the special thing is that they actually sit in the same harmonic trap and that they have a charge. So now they have a charge, so this one moves around, so Coulomb interaction pushes this one. So, so their motion is actually, they are just kind of uh, coupled oscillators, and now I can talk to this com uh, common motion or so to do two qubit gates or, or these things. Here, I really have separate harmonic oscillators, and all what this means is, okay, that, that the atom actually moves a little bit around. Very good question. Okay, so okay, spin spin interaction no good. 
maybe electric dipole interaction. Actually, uh, let's look what the electric dipole operator is. So there's some normalization. And then I have a dipole, mo uh, dipole operator for atom I and for atom J. And OK, there's also uh, this angle, de uh, angle dependence. Um, J, N, where N is just here the vector that connects the two positions. So it's just the projection of this dipole vector onto the connection between the two atoms. Uh, divided by, okay, this scales as the distance uh, cubed. So this is just like your, your classical dipole-dipole interactions, but now in operator form, so put on little heads. Uh, and, and this is the thing that we would like to use. And okay, you might ask, okay, what's the electric dipole moment of, or, or this uh, moment operator of the atom? Well, di is basically now this electrical charge and the position of it. So think of of your atom maybe having here positive uh, core and electron is around uh, charge. So um, so the dipole moment of this is the expectation value of E relative to nucleus. Okay, so, so this is what we're talking about when we think about the electric uh, dipole moment of the atom. And immediately, basically, what, what you find is for, uh, for symmetric atoms, and okay, what does, uh, yeah, for symmetric atoms, and all atoms are pretty symmetric, um, this expectation value is zero. And what this means is that atoms, they don't have uh, no permanent electric dipole. And basically, okay, then, then that makes sense. Uh, you have the atom, the electron is in this S wave function, but okay, it's equally likely to be anywhere. If I average over that, okay, there's no electrical dipole. So that sounds bad. Why can we still use this dipole-dipole interactions? Well, this operator, we should really think about this operator and evaluate its elements in the basis of the atom, and now the atom can be in many states. So if we if we take this dipole dipole uh, this dipole operator and we ask okay what is it in the five s state here and the five s state here uh, kind of that uh, um, element it's it's zero so 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 that is zero so basically the diagonal of this uh, operator is zero uh, but if I have a different state a here then I evaluate this matrix element. This can be uh, non-zero. And this is exactly uh, not your permanent dipole moment, but this is your transition dipole element. And that is actually the same element that also describes how strongly maybe this transition from this 5S state to this 5, uh, 5P state couples. So this is the same thing that enables these transitions these are the non-zero elements, and these are the uh, interesting elements uh, here. Um, but okay, now we could evaluate this, for example, between the 5S and the 5P state. Uh, what you will find is still a problem. Still, this, this magnitude of this, of this transition dipole operator um, for let's say, low transitions, so transitions, I don't know, from the 5S to the 5P state is uh, too small. 
is still very small. Of course, you might say, okay, but we have 10 seconds, so maybe it's larger than the hertz level spin spin. But the problem is also, okay, if I w was taking the 5s to 5p state, is that these excited states, they decay relatively fast. States decay. For instance, here this 5p state. 5p maybe decays on the order of 10 nanoseconds. So I would have to have a transition dipole element that is maybe gigahertz strong to, to do something useful in these 10 nanoseconds. Okay, and now maybe you already sense where this is heading. So now if I go up the ladder, I don't go to the 5p state, but I go way up, I go maybe to the 100p state or the 100s state. So I take this principal quantum number up, then I'm getting into these so-called Rydberg states. So Rydberg states is just high principal quantum number. And there's no exact definition. I can't say uh, once it's 30 or so it's a Rydberg state. I think everybody would probably agree 30 should be a Rydberg state. I don't know if 10 is already a Rydberg state. Uh, there's no like definition, but it just is high principal quantum number. So these states have large uh, transition dipole moments. So this d n, okay, n is now the principal quantum number, scales roughly as n squared. So okay, maybe uh, five wasn't enough, but okay, now if I go to a hundred and a hundred squared, so I get a huge boost in this dipole moment, transition dipole moment, plus, plus what is amazing, uh, Rydberg states. Rydberg states are long-lived. So my 5p state decays in 10 nanoseconds. Maybe my, let's say, 70s state and decays maybe on the order of 100 microseconds. So I get a huge boost in the lifetime I get a huge boost in the transition dipole elements. Suddenly, I can get these strong dipolar interactions. Okay, okay, any, any, um, I, I go a little bit more into details wh what that exactly means. Th this, uh, this was a bit hand waving. So, okay, always drawing atoms, always drawing energy levels, but every time it's a <laughs> different one. So, here I have I and J. Let's say I've initialized my hyperfine state, so here's just one ground state. And, okay, somewhere there's a 5s state or 5p state, I don't care. I actually want to go here, maybe up all the way, let's say, to 100, n equals 100. So n equals 100, now I'm all the way up there. There are many states still up there, so, so I might have the n equals 100 state here. I have uh, n equals 99 here, maybe 101 here. Actually, as I go higher, they kind of get closer together. So, so I have all these uh, states there, and uh, of course I also have all the s, the p, and all the uh, um, orbital angular momentums. And now the states, or the transition dipole elements that, uh, that I'm considering, so here might be state number A, or state B. Here's uh, state, I'm just picking some C, and here's uh, state D. So the transition dipole elements I care about are now these here. I have D, A, C, and here I have D, B, D. So these are kind of the, the elements that are now really strong and that can give me this strong dipolar um, interaction. So how do I describe this? Um, 
the way I describe this, I go into a pair state basis. So, of course, you might be tempted to say, oh, atom I is in state A and atom J is in state B. Instead, I actually want to talk about both atoms at the same time, and I could have a pair state AB. And another pair state would be, for instance, here CD. And okay, the energy of the states here, so E, A, B, is just the energy of my, oh, maybe small letters. It's just the energy of uh, my E, A plus E, B. And okay, E, C, D is just uh, E, C plus E, D. Now, in these pair states, then, the energy, of course, of my A, E, A, B doesn't have to be equal to E, C, D. Actually, it's very unlikely that it's equal. Maybe I go to the 100S state, and now I'm asking the question, what is 100S here, 100S here, compared to 99, let's say, P here, and, and 101 P there. Those energies don't have to be the same, so they can be, or typically, there's here a detuning. And uh, this detuning is, of course, just the difference of E, A, B minus E, C, D. Yeah. Okay. So now what I can do, I can write down the Hamiltonian in these pair states. And um, I'm, I'm going to do a couple of approximations. Or no, let's 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 write down this Hamiltonian first, just for these states. H Yeah, I, I can have my V J I divided over R. No, no, sorry, sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm confusing myself. <laughs> no, no, divide. <laughs> okay, I have some coupling between these pair states. I'm, I'm going to specify what it's uh, later. So, so I have, yeah, I have a V, I, J, and now I have these pair states A, B, and this couples to this other pair state C, D, um, plus the emission conjugate of them. And this uh, V, I, J is my interaction strength. So this is how these two pair states couple, but of course there are many, many more pair states. Maybe I could have a transition element between 100S here, 100S uh, there, and then here maybe 98P and 102P, so there are many. But uh, there are approximations in general approximations um, first approximation is only very few and dipole coupled states uh, contribute so I don't have to care about like this whole zoo of pair states often it's maybe only one or two that uh, contribute States contribute. And, and these are the ones for which this E, A, B is not too dissimilar from E, C, D. And uh, maybe second approximation I would like to do, Sep second approximation, uh, this dipolar interaction, of course, has an angle dependence. P states look different from S states. Uh, but I'm just going to neglect angular dependence. And now what this allows me to do, I can write this Hamiltonian. I only care about now this uh, two pair states, transition element from D 
A to C state and B to D state over R to the 3 I J, the distance between the atoms, and then A, B is coupled to C, D. And this is not completely correct. This is not completely correct because we also had this slight detuning here. So it can be that one of the states is at slightly en uh, higher energy. So then we have also this energy term. They're not exactly on resonant D, C, D. Sorry. D, C, D, C, D. All right. So this is describing the interaction between now these pair states, these Rydberg states up there. The first term is basically these pair states, they can flip-flop. I could go here to 100S state, and they can flip-flop to 99P here and maybe 101P uh, there. And the second term is an energy offset from the fact that these energies are not exactly on resonance. So this uh, energy offset here, has a name. Uh, this is called a first defect. And it really depends on which state you pick, which Rydberg state tells you how large this first defect is. And let's let's uh, play with that a little bit and first go into the first situation where we have resonant resonant interactions. So this means that this delta is equal to zero. So now I have a really simple Hamiltonian. I just have a Hamiltonian that has uh, this D, A, C, D, B, D here, divided over R to the three between the atoms. And I have these flip-flop terms, A, B, C, D. What does this mean? Uh, that means if I now have two atoms, okay, we don't even care too much about the ground states, and they have a Rydberg state up here, and actually they have um, two Rydberg states here. So, so these are really the interactions are between different Rydberg states. Now what can happen is, uh, that I excite this atom here, and this atom is here. So this is R1, R2, Rydberg state. And now what this Hamiltonian is describing that, okay, basically I get a flip-flop. This guy goes up, and this one goes down. But this is a, a sigma plus, sigma minus interaction. So, so, so I'm raising one, and I'm lowering the other one. So this would be, um, yeah, this would be kind of a flip-flopping spin model that you could realize like that. Okay, let, let's. Um, I'm going to show you an experiment that did this. It was a cool experiment. So this is realizing these resonant dipole interactions in a really nice way. Here you see this, uh, what, what I was drawing. Okay, atoms in the ground state don't really care about the ground state. We care about these Rydberg states up here. And this, uh, the specific Rydberg states they were using was the 62D state and the 63P state. And then basically uh, they took two atoms in this experiment here and they put one in the P state and one in the D state. And then they saw over time how here basically the P state goes down and, and, and then it goes up on the other one. So, so they, they see how these things flip-flop around. So they can resonantly exchange uh, um, the, the spin or, or the energy in this uh, special situation where this first uh, defect is zero. And here they very nicely characterized how this flip-flop interaction changes as you change the distance. 
And here, very importantly, what you see here, this, uh, this length scale, this is actually crazy. You put the atoms 30 micrometers away from each other, and even 30 micrometers away, you almost still get kind of a megahertz of flip-flopping speed. So extremely fast, and these states are, I don't know, 100 microseconds long-lived, so you can see many of these flip-flopping cycles. This is, this is very, very cool. And we are very much almost at the end of it. Um, so, so, um, yeah, so, so um, this is a very special situation. It's kind of a special situation where I bring two atoms up and I have these resonant pair states and I get these flip flops around. It's kind of uh, theoretically, it's, it's the thing that's easier to understand. Experimentally, it's the thing that's way harder to realize. So what actually in the experiment, uh, in the situation in the experiment, that is way more typical, you actually have the, what do we call it, A and B. Uh, you have the second case, B, and that's non-resonant interactions. And this uh, is when, when this delta is not equal to zero. And, okay, I, I just need two minutes. Uh, uh, and, and what happens here, okay, I have this pair state AB, and I have this other pair state CD. It's somewhat close, so this, there's a delta. It's, it's not zero, but it's yeah, also not too far away. So, so what this means is actually that I, okay, I have this coupling that is D, A, C, D, B, D over R to the 3. That would be my resonant coupling, but now it's detuned by delta. So I can't resonantly exchange now uh, these spins, but still this off-resonant coupling is actually going to have an effect. And for that, I do uh, just a perturbation theory. Uh, perturbation, what it does actually, it shifts my energy. Now, my energy EAB gets shifted due to this off resonant coupling. And because it's uh, now second order perturbation, I have these dipole elements there, DBD, uh, but they are all squared and they are over now R6, so, so R3, uh, R cubed squared is R6 over delta. So I'm getting an energy shift of this rydberg rydberg state. So now my Hamiltonian looks different. My Hamiltonian doesn't have this nice dipole-dipole interaction flip-flopping anymore. It just has some constants and then an R to the 6 dependent, so it's actually uh, kind of scales pretty drastically with distance, uh, A, B, and this A, B state gets shifted by energy. So this is all that happens, actually. Uh, I'm, I'm getting these shifts. But in the next lecture, we are going to see that these energy shifts, uh, they are extremely powerful. Um, so, so basically, uh, yeah, they, they will be our main tool for these Rydberg interactions. And this uh, non-resonance interaction is called uh, Van der Waals interaction. Wow, and, and you're really lucky because we ran out of time. I couldn't get to the homework, so, so I will get to the homework <laughs> next time. Uh, yeah, so, so this is it, but uh, please ask questions if you still have, if we have a moment. Yeah, yeah. So, Questions? Yeah, I, I apologize. There were many kind of atom levels, but the whole goal was just to, out of the many, simplify it to just a few with the optical selection rules. And then we made it a little too boring. We just had single qubits. And now the whole goal is to make it more interesting again by getting these interactions through Rydberg. Yeah. So at the end with the final experiment you showed, uh, there was some room for tunability 
of the interaction. Yeah. yeah. So my question is, how does this tunability compare with something like a flashback resonance, which is a Ooh. more... <laughs> I don't know. It's more familiar to me, at least. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's actually less familiar to me. <laughs> um, so, so flashback resonance, basically, when you kind of uh, uh, tune the the uh, scattering between atoms through magnetic fields, is also extremely uh, tunable. Um, but I would say I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, a very different regime. Um, it's it's maybe something you would use in kind of a degenerate gas or maybe in an optical lattice. Here, I'm really thinking isolated atoms. And now I can really kind of either maybe have this flip-flop terms between the Rydberg states or this kind of energy shifts through the van der Waals. So, so it's a quite different type of interactions. It's not like that they are scattering or, or anything like that. Yeah. So in Professor, about the resetting of the system, you just get new atoms on the tweezers or yeah, something? Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually a cool, in some sense, I mean, the awesome thing about atoms is, okay, if I have this atom here and you have also a rubidium-87 atom, they will behave completely the same. Okay, we should make sure we have the same magnetic fields and so on, but okay, if, if this was in the same setup, okay, if I let go of this atom and I load a new one, it's identical to the one before. So I can, uh, even though I kind of start from scratch, and this is the thing that maybe people like superconducting qubit people find so surprising, they make this chip and of course the qubit is always there. I, I kind of made the qubit here. I'm kind of getting a new qubit or a new spin uh, from this cold cloud of atoms again. So I, I should say this is kind of what I'm describing like with this long experimental sequence is the typical way people do experiments, uh, probably I will not get there in the end of my third lecture to talk about new frontiers. What's now on everybody, people's mind, and probably you even, when you look at this, is just, okay, how incredibly wasteful is that? Like, you, you have this 100 milliseconds, actually the most interesting thing maybe happens here in one millisecond. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could run these experiments continuously? Always have atoms, you don't have to kind of reload them, but you always kind of, uh, maybe sometimes you lose an atom, but you just refill the array. So, so there are uh, quite a few experimental groups, also including mine, working towards having basic, basically continuous mode operation where you can always do experiments and you don't have to kind of reload atoms, or you reload atoms in real time while you still kind of do your calculation or your simulation here. So I think that will happen very soon this year or next year that people will have a continuous mode. This is more the typical thing, but actually the field is developing so fast. Uh, yeah. So pretty interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. May I ask you a question? Yeah. But uh, if you continue to reload atoms, don't you reload them uh, with a random phase? So you I exactly. So 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 you. Uh, you, you get a new fresh atom, but okay, maybe you had your most interesting quantum state and it's highly entangled. Of course, here this comes in and it's just uh, like in maybe like a simple zero or one state. Um, now you need kind of ways to get it back in there. So for example, okay, um, when you think about maybe quantum computing, quantum error correction, okay, you encode maybe your logical qubit in this quite complex state or you have like a, t uh, like a surface code state. Actually, you can have these codes kind of uh, that also correct for qubit loss. So, so where you lose a qubit and you kind of get a new one in and you kind of weave it back into the uh, error correcting code. That's just one example where, where there are ways of getting new atoms and then putting them back in, basically. 